Okay, welcome to episode 112 on, of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm excited to be speaking to Dr. David Pearl. Uh, Dr. Pearl originally qualified as a medical practitioner from St. Thomas's Hospital, London in 1984. He then went on to create and develop Dockleaf, one of the UK's most successful crisis management consultancies. He holds qualifications in leadership coaching and is a qualified psychotherapist and is experienced in hypnotherapy and NLP. Welcome, David. Thank you, Piers. Great to be here. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I sometimes like to begin the podcast just with, with where we met, and I think it was Northern Scotland, 2016. So You've about... got a better memory than me, but yeah, Forres <laughs> on a Mankind Weekend. Yeah, yeah, I do yeah, remember. That's right. We were in the main hall, kind of divvying up jobs, and I remember being stood next to you and going, oh, that's David. <laughs> i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing <laughs> it, it's a good thing because it was like oh because i think we were on a team together and we were kind of doing something uh i can't remember what it moving carpets possibly something like that yeah quite likely yeah so how i'd love to begin the podcast is for you to share a bit of your journey how what's your journey been to get into the work you're now doing Oh, God, it's long and convoluted. I mean, I um, always wanted to be a pilot, love flying, still love flying. That's my number one passion, I suppose. And um, coming from a Jewish family, I have what I call Jewish mother syndrome. You know, my, my parents didn't feel like my son, the pilot, had the same panache as my son, the doctor, or my son, the lawyer. So I think they there was a bit of manipulation going on behind the scenes and 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 I can see now how I was trying to get my parents' approval and uh, went to medical school. I was fortunately bright enough to get in. My heart was never really in it, though, in, in, on reflection. So did five years, qualified, and then got into that rut of uh, house jobs and uh, starting to do my further postgrad education for general practice, but never really happy. I was always felt like I was a square peg in a round hole. And um, then sort of did general practice for a while and absolutely hated it. And I remember once walking into a supermarket and having a full-blown panic attack. And I knew what was happening from a, a, a medical point of view, but it was that terrifying. And I just knew that I was desperately unhappy in what I was doing. So left left medicine and did repatriation medicine, which combined my love of traveling and flying and, and a bit of medicine as well, flying around, bringing back sick people to to the uk for insurance companies and during that time i was seeing tra tour operators getting into deep water in crisis and they were ill prepared to deal with them so um i eventually set up a company a consultancy to help pre pre predominantly travel companies plan and prepare for mass fatality events and i grew that over the years and we diversified into trauma psychology and there was always this yearning, I suppose, with my own trauma that at that time I didn't recognize, um, pre predominantly coming from my father's experience in him being an Auschwitz survivor. And uh, I, I remember going when I eventually went into therapy when in my 40s, saying to my therapist after the second session that um, my father's a survivor, but that hasn't affected me. And I think that was probably the biggest understatement that I ever made. So, um, yeah, I'd set the crisis consultancy up, um, did that for about 15 years. I tend to get bored, uh, that seven-year itch and always looking for something else to do. And then started to retrain as a psychotherapist, realizing that the crisis consultancy was not going to keep me fulfilled. And when I was with, in therapy with a quite gifted therapist, I actually enjoyed the way she worked and I had seen other therapists and the change never embedded. And yet the work I was doing with her started to really sink in and embed. And she was transpersonally trained. So I went to that college where she trained um, and that's where I developed Limerence, which we may talk about later on, which for me was a life changing event and has shaped a lot of the work that I do now with couples therapy with my wife. And originally went to do 
therapy training just really for for personal development because i knew that weekly psychotherapy was never going to be enough to sort out my own transgenerational trauma and my own trauma my own lived experience as well and um when i started doing the therapy and we had to see clients i really enjoyed it and i fa- and i finally found at the age of about 45 50 that i could do something that i enjoyed that i thought actually i might be able to do reasonably competently as well and so i then started working as a psychotherapist started a practice uh, then also did some leadership coaching training which was through psychosynthesis which is another psychospiritual type of therapy and i now work combining those sort of modalities um some of the time i work with my wife we see couples with um as a couple together so that's unique not a common thing she's also a trained therapist and i spend i suppose the other half of my time predominantly coaching men and and um, providing therapy for men which i absolutely love you know i do think that m- many men we've lost our way and uh, I've listened to a lot of your stuff and sort of similar views, I think, to, to what you share. So that's a real potted history of, uh, and there was no, you know, I didn't set out. It just, I meandered through life and um, it took me a long time to really find my groove, as it were. And uh, yeah, and now loving what I do, feel really privileged. Uh, it's a privilege, you know, the work that we do to have an insight into in, into the real intimate personal details of other people's worlds. And um, I just cherish that. So, yeah, feel very, very gifted. Um, I mean, very lucky, privileged, not gifted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that that's that's the potted history of how I got to be here and meet you on a, on a men's weekend through the Mankind Project. And here we are. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. What a fascinating journey. I can resonate one of my best friends who i've also interviewed on the podcast he was trained at guys and tommies and my grandmother possibly my grandfather as well they met well one trained at at st thomas's and i think they also met because she was a nurse he was a doctor so some synchronicities there which i uh fascinating nice yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. (laughs) so One of the things, you know, I would love for us to begin with is your story of boarding school, because I think it's quite unique, a story. And I just think a lot of my listeners, they have been to boarding school themselves or are married to someone who's been to boarding school. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about your story. Yeah, and I never really stopped to think about boarding school survivor syndrome until really the work that you did and and reading Nick Duffel's book. But I, so I went to a, a local um, junior school, and then at the age of eleven, my parents wanted me to go to um, I think it was the only Jewish boarding school in the country, Carmel College. And so at the age of, age of eleven, I was packed off. Um, I think that my parents had some warning already that I'm not good when there's that separation. I mean, I'm anxiously attached or probably anxiously avoidant. And twice before when I'd been sent away to summer summer schools, um, boarding, which was boarding for a week, I was so unhappy that they had to come and bring me back home early. And so they sent me to Carmel College and exactly the same thing happened. I, I became almost suicidal with despair. Um, and wanted to come home and they wouldn't, you know, they paid so much money. So they, there was that pressure, even at the age of 11 for me, oh my God, you know, they've spent all this money on my education and yet I'm unhappy and want to go home and desperately missing home. And yet there was this conflict because I never felt close to my mother. So there was a real sort of split in my head. And I remember, I think it was on a Wednesday afternoon, we were let, let out to the local town of Waddingford and I'd planned my escape. And um, I, I found out the local time trains and uh, we went, walked into town and I just left the other boys that I was with. And I remember walking past a, a bush of berries that I grabbed, poisonous berries. And I thought, well, if if anybody stops me, I'm going to eat these so I get really ill or even maybe kill myself because that's how desperately sad I was. That never happened. Got the train um, back to London. Um, had no money. I think I just jumped. I don't even remember. I don't think I brought a ticket. I can't remember. And phoned my parents at Paddington. 
Um, they called the police and uh, somehow, and I don't remember how I got from Paddington back home, whether the police came and picked me up and took me home. But I said to my parents, that's it. I'm not, I'm not going back. I was so desperately sad. And uh, so my, my boarding school experience was very short lived. Um, and in some ways maybe escaped some of the abuse because like many of these boarding schools, I think one or maybe even more of the teachers were, prosecuted for pedophilia um so you know there but for the grace of god go i um but it was even for a week it was still a traumatic event mm. and um and then really sort of i suppose empathize with boys that get sent away to boarding school and i was 11 but how boys deal with it at six or seven or i i I just don't know. And I don't know. I, I, you know, my view on parenting has changed so much with the therapy that I've done on myself and that I do. And I just don't understand how parents can send their children away at such a young, tender age and put them in the hands of people that they don't know. Um, you know, just, yeah. So that's my story of my boarding school story. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's interesting. I, uh, Suzanne Zedek, who we mentioned before we began uh, recording, you know, she in when we interviewed her for the film, she says it's so important for us to hear people's stories. And I think hearing your stories and then reading other people's. And I've just in this last week been reading the account of uh, Will Carling, the England rugby captain, and also... Um, Clive Woodward, the England manager, both boarded. Clive Woodward said um, that he calls it his boarding school time, the dark years. And his words were, God, I hated it there. And then Will Carlin talks, he went age six, lying at the bottom of the bed, you know, cur curled up, just crying because he didn't want anybody to hear him crying. And it's just heartbreaking. Yeah. And I yeah. really can't hear I, very few stories do I hear where someone doesn't say, oh my God, yeah, it was horrific. Yeah. Well, I have a cousin who went also to Carmel College and I'm close to him about a year later. And he, um, and he was at Dulwich College before and he, but he had good experiences, mm. but his, his constitution, I think is very, very different and maybe some kids are i don't know me but i was going to say more robust but at, at that young age you know how robust can a child be mm. um you know and how how those experiences i think at any age just being sent away from from the primary caregiver our mothers um can't be healthy for us as it, it when our brains are developing and evolving at such a pace so um yeah i, I would certainly be the, up there anti-boarding school yeah yeah thank you thank you yeah so you know one of the areas i'd love for us to talk about today is a bit about intergenerational trauma you know this idea that you know if our parents or our grandparents or our great grandparents have been through something how does that affect us as a child as someone in that family. So I'd love you to talk about intergenerational trauma. What is it to begin with? Yeah, so I think that there's, in psychotherapy, we say that we carry the trauma of seven generations. Um, and other people say it goes back even further. I was reading about with slavery and, and uh, with, with those populations, maybe even 14 generations. But the theory is that if we don't, metabolize we don't process we don't resolve and do the grief the necessary grief work with our own trauma it will leach out unconsciously to the next generation and so even though you know if you spoke to my dad who's still alive he can't understand why his experience that he went through would have impacted me or my three sisters and yet we all struggle with mental health issues um, and I think that it, it, we just absorb it. You know, we're like I said, you know, young children are like sponges. And so if a parent is not present emotionally or is some way um, responding in a way from their own trauma in a hypervigilant state, the children are going to pick that up. And so I'm absolutely a believer in them. And I see this more and more in my own practice where 
you know, I've, I have some clients who actually their own experience, their lived experience is not too bad. You know, they haven't had overt abuse. There might be that emotional benign neglect that, that we sometimes talk about where parents are just neglectful, but it's not overt abuse. And, and we, you know, maybe we just don't know enough about whether that's enough or, but certainly where in their, in their lineage, there's been significant trauma. There's been a parent perhaps who's been orphaned or adopted. Um, and I, I'm starting to think that that in itself, even though they themselves might have had a good enough parenting that they still absorb that trauma from a parent or a grandparent, certainly if it's a parent. And, you know, with my own experience, um, you know, I had a mother that was, I describe as a rageaholic. She was quite, quite angry and at times aggressive. And at, my father just was very passive. He, he, you know, but he functioned, he built a business. So at the outside world, my childhood wasn't too bad. You know, I went, I still went to uh, public school, private school, uh, once I left Carmel College, but it was a day school. There were boarders there. And I had a good education and I never wanted for anything materialistically and I was at home, but there was this this conflict between me and my mother. But I do believe that, you know, I struggle a lot with with my own, you know, I just mentioned before about being neurodiverse. And I, when I was doing my therapy training, I came up with a whole list of uh, different conditions that complex PTSD, codependency, uh, avoidant personality disorder yeah I, I came up with about 20 different things and and a lot of those things I think well is that from what I went through or is it because my father I mean he was 11 when he went into Auschwitz wow. um seven of his brothers and sisters and his parents were murdered um in the in the gas chambers or the work the work battalions he then went on to the death marches where he just, how he survived I don't know I mean, people just survived I think it just was just pure luck um, and then he was liberated from Dachau. And I realized that so much of that trauma was in me. And I went with him to Auschwitz about 10 years ago. And I, whenever I was telling anybody about, um, I'm going, going back. So even now I would say to them, I'm going back to Auschwitz with my father. I'd never been there. So why would I say I'm going back? I was going there for the first time. He was going back because he'd obviously been there for, for a while. And yet it felt natural for me to say, I'm going back there. And when I went there, it, it, it was as if, you know, parts of it felt familiar, almost in my DNA. It was the weirdest experience. And we, I think we do know that the DNA can change through trauma. So um, I think the research, and there's been quite significant research on children of Holocaust survivors and other trauma survivors about how, our DNA does get changed and sort of by, by those experiences. So I'm a big believer that that trauma that our parents went through, we carry. And you know, times are different. My father, when he came to the UK after the war, there wasn't therapy. There wasn't, you know, it was it was just put up, shut up, get on with it, rebuild your life, get married, have children to make make up for the lost siblings that were murdered. And he still now even finds it really difficult, can't talk about this stuff, thinks that what I do is a bit of a cult, you know, and uh, very anti-therapy because yeah, he's, it, to him it's just it's it's a step too far to go into that trauma that he went through. And I, I get that. I mean, I can understand why he would never want to unpack the horrors that he would have gone through, you know, just uh, – and I've read and listened to a lot about the Holocaust and not just the Holocaust, other atrocities that as as humans, we perpetrate on other people. I was in Cambodia a few years ago, the killing fields there. And, and you know, it, it, it saddens me that we just don't learn. We do not learn how to live and and just accept people for who they are and just be tolerant of other people's views and just accept other people are different. And the world seems to be getting more divisive. Um, you know, and your, the work that you're doing on your documentary, it sums it up, how traumatized our leaders are and how, how much, how lack of awareness there is around this. So, yeah. So transgenerational trauma. And I, I, in my training was never really talked about, 
I don't think it's recognized enough. Maybe with time it will be more so. I don't know what's you know. I'd like to. What's your experience of it? Well, yeah, and I, as you're speaking, it's fascinating. I, you know, to hear your father's experience, it's like, oh wow, heartbreaking. And I've I've read a few books. Um, I'm trying to think, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl's experiences, which are again, you know, heartbreaking. Yeah. I guess a question which comes to me is. You know, it's almost the question is that it's around boarding school is that so many parents go through these schools. They then send their children there. And then when later on the children ask their parents was what were your experiences of boarding school like? They say it was horrific. Oh, I was sexually abused. I was beaten. I'd love you to talk to that a little bit. That Why is it that we go through as adults these horrific experiences? But then we say that, well, you know, so my father went to boarding school himself, you know, and then I was sent and my grandfather, you know, so many of my family went. It was the done thing. So I'd love you to talk a little bit. Why do our parents do that? <clears throat> and maybe it's just, as you say, it's, it's, it's the done thing. It's peer pressure. It's, you know, I don't want to be seen to not be following what my ancestors did. I don't want to drop the ball. Um, I, I don't know. I don't understand it. As you say, it, certainly if, if somebody has been sexually abused, why would they want to put their children back into that environment where, where to repeat that? I mean, Freud talks about the repetition compulsion and maybe there's something unconsciously playing out with the, the parents where, you know, Freud's view was that we'll keep recurring, repeating these patterns, hoping unconsciously that we're going to get a different outcome. So maybe if they put their own children into a similar environment and maybe they'll go through an experience but have a different outcome to the one that they had. So maybe there's something there, but I I don't understand it. You know, may, it's just perhaps lack, lack of critical thinking or, or, or not p parents not, realizing that they do have an ability to make a different choice to what maybe their gen generations of ancestors have done before them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah do you almost feel that it's because by them bucking the trend it means they'll suddenly have to look at the unexplored life and suddenly it's like well actually there's a lot of grief there or by keeping on with the joneses it's like I don't have to look at this. Yeah. That, yeah. I, I think that's a really good point. And there may be a bit of that as well. You know, that, yeah, they, the ego is so fearful of looking at itself mm. and the, the parents will, will even put their children back into a similar environment to avoid themselves having to hold up that mirror of introspection mm. possibly. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, I've heard a few stories of people who sent their children to my school and their children won't talk to them anymore. Wow. Because their parents sent them to that. The boarding school, yeah. To yeah. Way. Yeah, and that's really sad. Um, yeah, it happens, you know, parental alienation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, sad. So I'd, I'd love for us to segue a bit into, uh, now into limerence. Yeah. I'd love what is it to begin with and then yeah how does that play out in relationships because i can well, i'll let you describe it so what what is it so i describe it as love addiction on steroids limerence is when you develop an addictive obsessive infatuation to another person and it might be somebody that you just met which was in my case i just met this girl a week before and had no more than two conversations for 20 minutes. And I was complete, uh, completely hijacked. It was like a mind virus. So sometimes it's somebody that you've known for a while that you've been friends with, and then just something switches or flicks. And then that romantic attraction ramps up to, to just disproportionate levels. And 
there's a, a number of symptoms where we're, we are constantly rehearsing what we're going to say to the person. We're hypervigilant around them, wanting to make a good impression. We're, we're reading into their body language, everything, every word they say, we're trying to analyze to see whether, they, and it's all about, do they like us? I think so much of limerence comes from, as with all love addiction, a lack of self-esteem, our core not feeling good enough about ourselves and wanting to get that external validation from another human being. Um, I do believe that most affairs have an element of limerence to them. And um, many people think that they've met their soulmate, you know, and this is the, I think there's two schools of thought. You have the twin flame theory, which I'm, I don't buy into or the soulmate theory where, where you've met your twin flame, your soulmate, and this person's going to make you feel complete. Or you take more the view, which I call wound mates, where it's some past trauma that is resonating with this other person. And then there'll be, there's a whole host of other factors at play here around attraction, around reproduction, around evolutionary psychology that plays into it. But for me, it was the most discombobulating, painful experience to be addicted. It's bad enough to be addicted to drugs or alcohol or, or anything else that we get addicted to. But to be addicted, and I do believe it's an addiction, to another human being is incredibly painful. And uh, it, it, you know, I told my wife and she supported me through this. And it took me, well, it was throughout the training that I would see this, this woman once a week. Nothing ever happened beyond, um, although I did disclose. And in hindsight, that wasn't the right thing to do because it, it, this was nothing about her with limerence. We say it's not about the limerent object. And it's a lot to do with objectification of the other person because we don't see them as a human being, we see them as an object. We put them on a pedestal. We build them up into this fantasy object of this Madonna or this uh, Greek Greek god. And um, that's not real. We don't see the real person. And in affairs, this is what happens. People really, you know, and I uh, probably a lot of my work now, maybe half of my work is around limerence. People having affairs in limerence. And every single time, peers, they they can't hear that this is just, an evolutionary flute to get you to go off, leave your family, go and connect with another person, procreate, have some more babies, because that's the only reason we're really here to keep the species going. And uh, it, you're still going to take yourself with you. And you're still going to take all your unresolved trauma, all your projections onto that new person and give it time, six months to three years, typically, you'll be back to square one because you haven't looked at what's going on, albeit a lot of it is unconscious, um, in yourself. And whenever we are looking to somebody else to make us feel whole and complete, that's problematic. You know, it's, um, you know, it's that external locus of control versus an internal locus of control. And we are putting so much pressure and expectation on that other human being to make us feel better about ourselves. And that can never work. Um, so that's limerence in a nutshell. It's um, I wouldn't I I wouldn't wish it on my worst en enemy. It really does destroy lives. I think people commit suicide through it. Um, and um, but yet yeah, for me, it was it was the biggest I think motivator for growth in in my marriage, and uh, also just in me personally to really dive into relationships, not just romantic relationships with my wife but relationships with everybody every you know because we all we're all in relationship you know you and i are relationship here and just got me fascinated into that whole thing about you know how do how we relate and what's it all about then i still don't have a lot of answers and i don't think we know i think we're just scratching the surface when it comes to romantic love and attraction um and we're very, I think, very lacking, certainly in the English language, with the words that we use for love. You know, the Greeks have about six or seven different words for different types of love. And we in the English language just, it's all sort of bundled up together. And just this romantic love is so different to the love I have for my children or, or to my, you know, to my brother peers or to whoever else it might be. Um, and yeah, so... That's limerence in a nutshell. Mm, really interesting. And I can resonate when you 
spoke about it a few weeks ago when we spoke. I was thinking, I've struggled with limerence most of my life. I'm aware of it now, and yet I can almost um, put it down to probably the first few months at boarding school, that beginning of transferring my heart onto someone else, girl. <clears throat> and like you said about making them into a Greek god, goddess, it's like that's what I was doing. It was like I couldn't talk to them because they yeah. you know, they were these deities. So I, it wasn't until I was 17 that I spoke really to, to girls very much, a little bit. You know, it was a mixed school, but I would fantasize, I would project, I would, you know, they were in my thoughts all the time. And I see that that carried on, you know, through yeah. pornography, you know, it's like that deification, that objectification. And Nick Duffel yeah. in Wounded Leaders says, you know, one of the things that comes out of boarding schools is we turn people into objects because of that rational way we're not connected with the other side of the brain yeah and everything yeah. becomes an object you're a collateral rather than the person <clears throat> human yeah and so i can really resonate with that and yeah it's uh, you know it feels sad and i and i see many men and women who who have this yeah and um i think it's little known in in the therapeutic community i mean the word is getting more um more known but when i got this which was 2010 so a while ago um i came i was googling for for months and then suddenly came across this word and i thought oh my god this is what i've got in it and, and there was a forum um that helped people that was run by an australian guy and communicating with other people on there and i remember saying to going to my wife and saying oh my god I've, I've got a name for what i've been struggling with and for her it was incredibly hard because it was another woman that i was mm -hmm. infatuated with and there was a part of me that would have quite happily run off into the sunset if this other woman had been compliant or complicit in my grand plan. Fortunately, she wasn't. And um, I remember saying to my wife once that, look, if I was addicted to cocaine or alcohol, what would you do? And she said, well, I'd support you. I'd help you. And I said, well, can you not do the same? I said, no, it's really difficult. But can you not sort of take the same viewpoint um, of this? But, yeah, it's... As you say, it, it, so yeah, the point I was trying to make is I went to my own therapist because I was in therapy at the time. I had to be because I was training as a psychotherapist. And she said, oh, it's just a crush. I said, no, I, it's not a crush. I mean, I've had, I've had crushes, you know, like attractions to, to other women throughout my life, even though I was married and I just never thought anything of them. They never got in the way of my functioning. And yet when I got this, it was literally from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep, this woman was on my mind. It was, I would say, 90, 95% of the time. And um, it's so, so disconcerting. And I think gradually with time, my therapist started to appreciate that this was something more than just a crush because week after week, I would go in with my yearning and fantasies of, of, of my, you know, my thought stream. And I think that the more we understand this, but, but it all links, I think, to childhood trauma. And I do believe, I, I can't remember who said it, that um, his view was all affairs start in childhood. Mm -hmm. And I think, as I said before, a lot of affairs do involve this limerence energy. And I do think that limerence, I've yet to work with a client, I've yet to work with an addict who hasn't had some significant you know, sort of childhood trauma and not big T trauma, just that small complex, small T trauma, you know, the drip, 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 drip of just not getting the, enough love as a child. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how can a boy that's sent off or, or girl, you know, sent off to boarding school, how can they get enough love at, at such a tender age? I mean, how old were you when you, when I you first went, went, I was eleven. Yeah, 
Right. So, you know, that's puberty. We start going through puberty and developing feelings for the opposite or the same sex, depending on how, you know, how we're wired. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I can resonate so much. You know, the childhood trauma, I think it's almost like, you know, I look at it sometimes on an archetypal level, the king, warrior, magician, lover, or queen, warrior, magician, lover. It's like the lover side, it was like it was no longer there or I had to squash it. And therefore, if you squash, you've got to put it somewhere. So I was putting it on to the girls. And it was like, save me, be mummy, because mummy was no longer there. I didn't realize yeah. that, you know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and yeah. I think there's quite a lot of shame, I think, involved in that, you know, especially when you're in relationship and then <clears throat> you're having these thoughts and these fantasies and realizing, well, they're not real there. Yeah. So what have you found that's really helped with limerence when you've worked with people? What's something that helps to heal that? Well, you just mentioned it and that is the shame. Um, people feel huge shame around developing an attraction for another human being. And I work with them to try and get to see that, look, this is just part of the beauty of being a human being. And there's absolutely nothing wrong in developing fondness, attraction, love, whatever the feelings are, you know, it's this thoughts and feelings that go on in our head. But, and then the behavioral output, the problem becomes when we start having outputs with the behavior where we want to leave out, our established family or and and pursue that because that's not necessarily the best course of action so i think it's demystifying it um as i'm sure you're aware the way to deal with shame is shine light on it and that was why i was really vocal you know from day one i talked about this at, at my college and it was incredibly difficult because this uh, the person i was limering over was on the same training course so it was really difficult for me but i thought i'm not gonna I'm not going to go inwards and 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 suppress these feelings. I just, I'm, you know, we were encouraged to be honest with how we feel. And so there I was being honest, and yet the college itself didn't know how to deal with this. Even though many people, even in my year and previous years, had affairs, marriages ended, and people that started affairs with, with other people on the course. It's very common, and they, they give you a, a health warning when you start psychotherapy training or counseling training your marriage might not survive it but let's get it out there let's talk about it let's you know there is no shame in in falling in what love or lust whatever you want to call it and and i don't have a problem with that you know my wife knows that i even now after all these years i still hold a place in my heart because this woman was life-changing for me um i set a forum up to help people with limerence i know that Two people met through that forum, got married and had two babies, two children. So through my experience, there's two more people in the world that would never have been made. So that's just beautiful. That's amazing. So I think, yeah, to go back to the question, how do I help? I think it's it's working on the shame that a lot of people feel. And also, I think with so much of this stuff, it is going back to the childhood wounds and, and at the grief work. I do believe that we have to grieve what what maybe our parents, if it's transgenerational, couldn't work through, or if it's our own trauma. We have to grieve for the, the, the inner child, the lost opportunities or whatever, you know, what happened to that child within us. And and that works painful, you know, I'm sure you know, you know, the the, the anger, the sadness, and it's heart wrenching at times. And nobody would voluntarily want to do that work if they didn't have to, because it's so damn painful mm -hmm. so i think that's also helping a client get to a place where they can do that sort of work and it's one of the one of the reasons why i'm a big believer in in group work and and in the mankind and i'm sure there's other equivalents to that because there's something in a bigger container that i experience and see myself whereas a therapist it's just a small container with me creating that container or if i'm working with my wife two of us but on a men's weekend, an experiential weekend, where we're getting out of our heads into our body, into some emotional feeling, you have a big container, 50, 60 men, staff men, creating that container. 
no, I've seen, you know, and uh, I'm sure Rod, you know, Rod Boothroyd, who I know you, you know, you know, will concur that sometimes magic happens in that container that doesn't happen in one-to-one therapy. So, mm. you know, where men can sink to a place, a much deeper place that they couldn't normally do. Mm. So, yeah, grief work, shame. Um, I think that that's the work. And talk therapy one of my frustrations is it's slow yeah yeah and i'm i'm impatient <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> me too I, I like to bring a lot of unconscious practices into my one-to-one work with people just to drop them into their bodies to become more somatic or you know going into the unconscious patterns and I find that's really helped me over the years, you know, working with a Jungian analyst in my twenties, doing a lot of dream work. And that was transformational. I couldn't cry. It's very dissociated. And that's why one of the things I was thinking about limerence. Do you feel there's a connection between dissociation? If we've learned to dissociate a part of ourselves split off, that that then gets put on to a person. It's like, <gasps> I need that person yeah. because it's 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 me. It's that part that I will I've disowned. Yeah, so I, I think that's that's another part of it. And Jung describes it as meeting the contrasexual aspects of ourselves. So we meet the anima, the mm-hmm. idolized anima, and that other person. But it's pure, yeah, it's pure projection. We're just seeing what's in us, but we, we've split off. It's unconscious. And we need to interject that part or take it back into ourselves. And and I was aware of that in my own therapy around the golden qualities of this woman. And what was I, you know, all those things I was projecting onto her were in me, but I had disowned them. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that is part of part of the journey as well. Um, Yeah. I like Jungian psych. I've never had, I've never been in therapy with a Jungian therapist, but I, I like the way, you know, from what I've read. They're fantastic. Uh, the love yeah. Jungian. It was, yeah, it changed my life. I was trying to commit suicide at the time, uh, self harming, very dark space. I'd lost a couple of stone in weight, about nine stone. And I started to work with her and I'd done therapeutic work counseling psychosynthesis uh, psychotherapy and nobody could get through my wounding and she started she asked me to start writing my dreams down and i would send them to her i mean it was intense i had to wake up two three times a night to write my dreams down then mail them to her uh you know I'm up to dream number 1,310, I think, at the moment. So I'm still going with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. It sounds you started your therapeutic journey much younger than me. I wasn't. It wasn't till I was in my late 30s that I had the courage. In hindsight, I was too scared. It's what we were saying before about parents sending their kids to private school so it's a way of avoiding looking at themselves there was a part of me that was so fearful Uh, but so how old were you when you started your journey well i was lucky because i just totally fell apart so i was 26 i think yeah it was 2000 i I fell apart i was essentially homeless for a period of time went to africa tried to help other people realized it wasn't other people that needed help it was me and I went to a monastery for 10 days and ended up staying three and a half years. One of the supporters of the monastery was a Jungian analyst and she offered free of charge to work with me. But it meant that I had to make a trip from the monastery to another city, which was a seven hour return journey every every week to do three or four hours of therapy and then wow. doing the dream work and I was a monastic, so we were getting up at quarter to five every day, uh, one, two meals a day. It was celibate. It was intense. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit insane looking back on it. It's like, what were you doing? But <laughs> That's quite a story. There must be a book inside of you somewhere, I think. <laughs> I've written one book uh, uh, called yeah, How to Survive and Thrive in Challenging Times, about partly about that journey. 
I've written my boarding school down, but I, I can't, have not been able to find a publisher. So it's just sat on my hard drive at the moment. Right. Um, I'll have to look the other one up that you published. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, wrote it after I came out about 10 years ago. Um, wow. So I'd love for us to segue into uh, relationships. I realize that, as I mentioned, time does go quick. <laughs> uh, so I'd love for us to segue a bit into you know, some of the common problems you see in relationships um, when you're working with couples. What's present in the zeitgeist at the moment? I, th I think the presenting, the most common presenting symptoms in people, we, uh, uh, sexual difficulties, mm. um, issues around money, mm. and issues with uh, a lot of our clients tend to be Asian. I think it's just where we live. Um, interfering family of origin mm -hmm. that is very common as well. But underneath that, I think the most common problem is communication difficulties. People not knowing how to communicate using clean, clear, concise language, um, fearful of conflict in so many, especially men. And I think one of the things, many of our mothers did us a disservice by not teaching us how to fight with women. And when I say that, I don't, I don't mean physically fight. I mean to really hold our ground and put a, a healthy boundary down and learn to say, no, I'm not doing that. And, and so many of the clients that I work with, especially men, I would say they fall into this nice guy syndrome. They, they want to be liked again, because deep down there's this wound that, they don't feel good enough about themselves, lack of self-esteem. And so they believe that, well, if I do things to get people to like me, if I'm nice, I'm pleasing, I'm pleasant, I don't, I avoid conflict, I don't speak my truth, I'm not authentic. But all that does is create chaos all around them. You know, it's, um, so I think that, but, but communication difficulties, I think at the, is at the root of a lot of stuff. And also, I think a lot of relationships become power struggles where it's almost like, again, our, our children come out to play. We, we, if there's conflict, we regress to a younger part of ourselves. And you end up with two people who, be, who regress to two little children who are back at school fighting in the sandpit about who's right and who's wrong. And there's a lovely quote by Harville Hendricks, who's a well-known couples counsellor, who says, you can either be right or you can be married. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I really like that. And uh, I think there's so much truth. You know, we say to couples, you know, pick your battles. You, you, you argue about so much stuff that is, is just noise that's just not worth arguing about. And then I think that, Ultimately, the work that we get to is what you touched on before, Piers, about the unconscious. I think that so much of what goes on in relationship is the unconscious projection. And I always remember a comment made by one of my tutors at college who had been married four times. He was 17. He said he would never marry a therapist. And the fifth time he married a therapist and he worked it out. And he said, suddenly, he said, when we both took back all our projections, the relationship became so easy. You know, we just gave each other space to be themselves. We weren't projecting our own unconscious, unmet needs onto the other person. And I would say that that's, you know, with both Ruth and I, my wife had, had to done a lot of, we've done, both done a lot of work and, and we don't project. But of course, there's times where me more than her, I'll project and my, I can get onto that drama triangle with her. But um, we, you know, we stop projecting onto each other at times because I'm anxiously attached. I'll feel insecure, but I've learned to manage that. She's the avoidance, so we have that classic pairing that's so common. So that's another thing that you know we look at is attachment style. But so they're all. But ultimately, I think it's trying to help couples realize that until they work on their own stuff, their own projections, it's really difficult to build a really deep, nurturing, loving relationship where we're not putting our demands onto the other person to make us feel better about ourselves. And I think the, our supervisor, um, Roger Evans, who ran the College of Psychosynthesis, where Ruth trained and where we both did our leadership coaching training, 
said that in his view, the goal of couples therapy is to get the two individuals into individual therapy. Mm -hmm. That's the main goal. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. You know, that as couples therapists, we can only help so far. We can help with some tools. We can help with, with some insights and, and some interventions. But actually, the much deeper necessary work, if we want to have those real deep, nourishing, intimate connections, means that we have to look at ourselves. And, and I'm going to see now, and I agree with Gabo Mate, we were talking about him before as well, that we're all wounded. You know, the, the, the norm you know the nor people say well that's normal yeah that might be the majority doesn't mean to say it's healthy we're all traumatized and i don't yeah i think that the textbooks when they talk about attachment theory which we haven't really talked about they say 50 percent of people are, are, are securely attached i just don't buy that i think very few people are securely attached i think most people are, are either avoidant or anxious or that that in between mix between the two but but most of us are traumatized it's impossible as a human mm -hmm. to have the perfect upbringing where we we're not wounded in some way yeah. and we play that out in our adult relationships everywhere mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fascinating yeah i hadn't really thought about the figures i'm kind of aware of the figures say in the boarding school dialogue about compliers rebels crushed get a sense for numbers of those but with the attachment styles it's like yeah i hadn't really thought of that i'd always thought quite a lot were securely attached um a lot were avoid some were avoidant you know smaller number were <clears throat> disorganized and anxious but yeah it's fascinating to to think that not many are securely attached but if people were securely attached, we wouldn't have a 50% divorce rate in marriages. And the other of those 50% that remain married from the research shows that probably about 40% are pretty miserable. Now, if people were securely attached, they would you would have a far higher number of marriages working mm -hmm. and you would have a far higher proportion of people in, well, not just marriage, you know, long-term relationships where people are happy. And their their needs are, are being met in those marriages, but you know whether they're emotional, physical, spiritual, um, intellectual, you know, our pies that we were talking about last time, we physical, intellectual, emotional, spiritual, and your R for relationship peers, peers, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that that those numbers would be much higher. Mm -hmm. So I I don't I don't buy it although i do recognize i see a very skewed population obviously people but i think even in the outside world outside of my my therapy room I, in my judgment a lot of them are not securely attached mm. our leaders i would argue certainly are not securely attached when i look at how they behave 100. whatever yeah whatever political divide they are i think they're all uh, can i swear or not i think <laughs> you'd have to yeah they're all fucked up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's obviously the, the work we're doing with the documentary. I've been doing quite a lot of research the last couple of months, just working out just how many global leaders and global in all areas, law to, you know, 70%, 70, 75% of all high court judges in the UK have been to private school. I don't know the division to uh, to boarding schools, but certainly quite a lot of them went to Eton, Harrow, Winchester, um, you know, and these institutions create insecurely attached people, whether that is avoidant, anxious, disorganized. You don't, you know, I think the definition Diane Paul Heller talks about in her book, The Power of Attachment, she says, you know, they were rejected by their caregivers left alone yeah. too much as children well that's the definition of boarding school yeah. nine months on your own each year yeah, yeah. that's since you know that's left alone too much you know? yeah um so yes i really see that that our leaders are are, are avoidant um or anxious or but certainly insecurely attached yeah um, so yeah just going back to um, some of the, the questions we've put down, um, 
I guess the other thing is you mentioned it a little bit about uh, emotional benign neglect uh, when we spoke a few weeks ago. So yeah. I'd love for you to talk a little bit because I spoke to um, another psychotherapist a few weeks ago, um, Graham Music, who I believe went to the same boarding school as you, um, who talked a little bit about neg emotional neglect. So I'd love you to to talk a little bit about that. What is that and how might that show up <clears throat> in adults? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think most of us, when we think about trauma as children, we, we, we're looking for some significant event to that child. And I think in modern society, and this is probably even more so now for the generation coming up, parents are just busy. They're, they're busy trying to survive. They're busy working, busy busy doing 101 other things. And, and also they're distracted. You know, how many times do we see parents who are just absorbed into the artificial world of the internet, of, of social media? And just that rupture with a parent. And I, and I see it, I've got an 18 month old grandson and I can see it so clearly with just with the, the work that I've done and the knowledge that I've gained, where if I'm sitting on my phone, he'll come over and pull at me and want attention. Mm -hmm. And children need that attention. They need that connection. You know, we have mirror neurons. And if a parent is not present, so it, a parent, you know, we talked about age scores before. It doesn't have to be a parent that is physically violent or, or abusing the child overtly. It just be that the, the parent is not, emotionally present because of their own trauma so they're you, you said before disassociated so they're not they're not attuned to the child the child picks that up the child knows that there there's not a connection that it's not safe they don't feel loved and wanted and cherished and, and nourished and nurtured and all those really important things that i believe we all need as human beings and so just through that emotional benign neglect yeah. So it's just it's neglectful. It's not parents on purpose trying to hurt their kids. And I don't think many parents do that. They don't go out to actually mess their kids up, but they, they, they're they just distracted with the problems of trying to survive in modern day living, even more so now with. Well, you know, in the West, I know we're, we're relatively comfortable and I'm really fortunate. I've traveled to over over 100 countries now and I've seen, you know, how how a lot of the countries you know, in a lot of places in the developing world, there's still a lot of poverty that, that, that those God knows for those kids where, where they're out begging at a young age or going over rubbish tips to find food and things like that, that they're all right. Their physical needs perhaps are just about being met, but certainly the other emotional and spiritual needs are not being met. How's that yeah. impacting them? So I'm, I'm mindful that it's easy for me to sit here and be critical of, of this, you know, you know, and this is what I said before about my father. He can't understand why I'm always searching and working on myself, personal development, because to him, I have it all. I had a comfortable upbringing, would never had a day where I've gone hungry or cold. You know, I've been very fortunate in, in that respect compared to the, the life that he's had and he can't understand why I'm but but it's that emotional neglect that he as a father wasn't able to to father me in the way that I needed as a child and my mother also because of her own trauma wasn't able to so it, I think it's very subtle and I don't, it's hard to measure mm. and in, in therapy and this is something that I I disagree with in therapeutic terms I'm I'm sure you've come across the term good enough parenting you know well, that's all a child needs children are resilient and as long as they get good enough parenting. And I believe that that's a, a term that therapists have come up with to avoid themselves having to look at their own inadequate parenting that they've done on their children. And um, I think that there's no such thing as good enough parenting. Children need more than that. And, uh, yeah, there's an imp it's impossible to raise children without some form of trauma or wounding. But as parents we could do a whole lot more, a whole lot better. And yet there's no conversation, no dialogue. And I remember um, uh, there's a, an American 
So he's a, he's no longer practicing psychotherapist, Daniel Mackler, who's got a very int- uh, active YouTube channel, written some books. And he wrote an article called uh, A License to Procreate, mm-hmm. which was, you know, and it's a very controversial article about what we as parents need to be able to uh, comply with to, before we should be allowed to procreate. And the few people I've discussed it with just are so triggered by it because it does really po- point out how most of us are just not adequately prepared to be parents. And the, me too. I've got two daughters, one you know, in their 30s now, and I've had to hold my hands up and hold myself accountable for the wounding that I've put onto them because I didn't know this stuff before I was a parent. And the reality is maybe none of us would get that license because we'd have to do so much work on ourselves to metabolize the trauma of our ancestors and to get into a place in life where we have sufficient money and safety and security and all the other good stuff that children need that none of us would be of an age where we're old enough to reproduce. So it's a, it's pie in the sky. But my frustration is, Piers, that this stuff's never talked about. You know, look at all the problems we have in this country and the, the, the division and, and uh, that's going on. And yet nobody talks about parenting and the role of parents and the importance of that. Um, these are, you know, huge problems that we don't have the answers to. It's a lovely book that I read called The Continuum Concept by Jean Lidoff. She was an ether, evolutionary anthropologist and she spent a long, I think about a year in a tribe, a very primitive tribe. I can't whether it was the Amazon or somewhere in the developing world, looking at how tribal cultures raise children and how there's not one mother that a child can go to any woman in the village and that is that's their mother they can get love or a hug if they fall over or something like that and just how those children grow up sort of far more evolved and and i think you know we we've, we've lost we've lost so much of this from when we'd left left uh, our villages to go into cities in the last few hundred years and uh, you know, we're developing at a pace it's, with technology where it's getting even worse you know that AI, we're just communicating and connecting with machines, not other humans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I so agree. I've heard quite a few stories. There's a a, a tracker, bushcraft you know, a teacher called John Young, who spent a lot of time with the sand bush people. And some of the stories he tells of them, you know, it's just beautiful. It's like they've got 25 people the children to go and speak to if they've oh i've just seen a worm oh, and they go and take it it's like they've got rather than it just being one person they can speak to they have the tribe to go and speak to yeah and yeah. it's just so beautiful that you know and one of my friends who i spoke to last night talking about some research a few years ago that they found that the community certainly in the uk 30 years ago was more together the most disparate community 30 years ago is the equivalent of the most together community now it's like we've just become you know we don't speak to our neighbors we don't really connect to people in comparison with 30 years ago and and yeah i do see that the importance like you said of group work yeah in a tribe yeah what's that saying isn't it it takes a village to raise a child and i think that's very true and yeah that we i think it was humans we crave we crave connection we need it we we can't survive on our own and yet we are we're living in a, a more and more isolated world yeah yeah it's yeah. uh interesting times ahead that's for sure yeah So as we start to wrap up, I'd love for you to share a little bit of your vision as a king, uh, you know, as a sovereign, you know, what do you see? What would you like to see moving forward? Do you mean holistically from a global perspective or? or, Yeah, macro, micro. uh, Just like I said before, I would love for people to be more accept to understand 
what projection because this i think ultimately is what it comes down to if if somebody triggers me it's projection it's something in me that i need to look at and if if somebody is different in some way what is it why do i feel threatened by that and i think this this um um, this division that this you know this divisiveness that's going on in the world more and more until we understand that just because somebody holds a different belief or ideology it doesn't mean to say that i still can't be in relationship in with them in some way and it, it's yeah it's just just i think just that it ultimately comes down to love rather than rather than hate that i just wish that we could learn to be more accepting more accommodating more loving to each other and more tolerant of of um of other people's you know and that's that's what makes the world for me so fascinating it's why i love traveling is because of the diversity and yeah and i know on the main the men's work we do at the mankind project that we're big into diversity and inclusion and i i i mean last year i staffed on the gbtq weekend mm-hmm. and it was for me I, I sort of identify as bisexual but certainly for me just listening to to gay men and their their struggles with coming out that that acceptance and it's only through i think safe places where we can talk about our beliefs our views our judgments and where do they and where do they come from and um how can we start dropping those and letting go of those things so that we feel all feel safer in the world because i think that's as every human being should have that that right and privilege to feel safe in the world and just to be accepted. And yet we've got a long, long way to go. You know, as you said, Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, it's a powerful book. And yet we're a long way from that still, you know, and look at the Middle East just in the last couple of last week, the craziness that's still going on. And I can't see any solution to that. Mm. So that that's my vision. Um, macro micro my own little room my own little world is just to keep working at being the best father grandfather husband friend um i'm getting the more i give back the more i get so continue on my path with the work i do with the mankind project and and on the leadership track there which i get a lot back from and just continuing the work that i do with my clients which which feeds me feeds my soul and as i said before i'm privileged to do so big little (laughs) trying to make sense of it all still trying to get my head around all this existential stuff of why am i here what's all this about (laughs) and at the same time not losing perspective that i'm just a little dot in this planet that's spinning around in this much bigger thing and not to lose sight of that as well but not to miss the beauty of it all Mm. yeah beautiful vision Thank you. That's a nice question. Yeah, I like the question. Thanks for asking it. I didn't expect that. <laughs> no, I didn't put it down on the questions. But <laughs> uh, yeah, safety and love. What a beautiful vision. So thank you. Yeah. Well, it's been a yeah. real pleasure. How do people find out more about your work? Well, the Limerence, um, there's a, a forum, uh, limerence.net, free to use forum um yeah. so limerence.net they can find and, and subscribe to there for free um and then with the couple's work and my men's work we work is the married mm-hmm. we have a tiktok channel and uh which our daughter has has, has nagged us to do and then we do instagram well, I, I don't do it we have somebody who does it for us but so we do some tiktoks occasionally and embarrassingly on this last weekend that i started the mankind project i had like four four men come up and say no i see you've come up on my tiktok feed (laughs) i've been watching you um and we just have small snippets about relationship tips and and hints and stuff like that so people can have a look at that and see us there but yeah beautiful well i'll put links to the married therapist's uh limerence.net and to tiktok and linkedin into the description so people please do reach out to to david and uh, watch some of his films or join the um the forum but 
thank you. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for your work and um, all that you do. Yeah, and likewise, Piers, you know, you're doing really important work as well and bringing attention to what you do. So appreciate that as well. And I've really enjoyed it. So you say, I can't believe an hour and 23 minutes has gone already. Scary. <laughs> yeah, time goes quickly. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye.